So the next section is about minimizing listeria contamination. So just to make sure we're sort of all on the same page, because I'm going to be talking about whole genome sequencing in a second. So you've got your patient and they become ill. Uh, so you determine that they have listeriosis and you collect a, a clinical sample and you find listeria. So those are three little listeria there. Um, so then you find out that they ate at food facility A. So you send uh, your environmental health person in to collect some sponge samples and you find listeria in those sponge samples as well. So then what becomes important is that we have all those listeria that we've collected and we need to see if they ma match. So in order to do that, we get the DNA out of the listeria, we sequence it. So similar to what you might remember from high school biology with your A's, C's, T's, and G's, you wanna figure that line up out for each of these uh, listeria and then you wanna match it up. And keep in mind, listeria, the size of the genome is about four million nucleotides. So you're gonna be matching it up across millions of nucleotide uh, base pairs to see uh, if these listeria match. So I've got just a short segment as an example of the six listeria that we collected in this uh, uh, example. And so you can see in red some of the differences. So let's say we use this first listeria as our reference and you can see listeria three is pretty, listeria two is identical, listeria three is pretty closely related. Uh, four and five look a little bit more different and six is identical. So uh, let's say that the top three are our pa collected from patients and the bottom three are collected from a food facility. Let's say food facility A. And so what you might get from, from your lab uh, personnel is you might see a phylogenetic tree. So this is sort of just like a family tree where siblings are really closely related on the family tree, whereas cousins that are more distant related, related or a different family altogether uh, are gonna be a little bit farther on the tree. So in this particular example, it looks like the three patients are pretty closely related and they look like they're pretty closely related to the listeria that was found in facility A on the floor. But there was other listeria found in this facility that seems to be unrelated. So one in the drain and one at, floor, at a floor wall juncture. Another way you might see this information displayed is in what's called a SNP matrix, so a single nucleotide polymorphism. And this just gives you the number of differences between the listeria. So lower numbers mean that they're more closely related. So the other listeria found at food facility A does not appear to be related to the first three patients uh, or the uh, isolate number three from food facility A. So I wanted to kind of bring you up to speed on that because when we're talking about listeria in a food facility, there's really two types. There's the transient listeria that comes in on the product or comes in just uh, on, on a person and that's a one-time isolate, and you don't find it over time because you get rid of it during your routine cleaning and sanitation. So what we're more concerned about is, and, and we, we try to limit the amount of transient like listeria that comes into a facility, but what we're really more concerned about is something that survives over time. So it's a resident or a persistent isolate, uh, sometimes called a pet. And what this means is that uh, it's repeatedly found in sampling, meaning that something is going wrong with cleaning and sanitation and it's, and it's living in what's called a niche uh, and able to survive, proliferate, and recontaminate food over time. So what we uh, might see is a, a deli case, for example, or a deli slicer. Um, so let's, let's uh, give an example in, in context with a deli. Uh, so let's say you've got your, your deli over area over here, your walk-in cooler back here, uh, and maybe you have another, a few other sort of high-risk uh, foods that you need to investigate. Um, so here's an example. You've got your, your sites along the left side here, and then the sampling uh, months uh, along the top here. And so this is uh, real-life sampling data from a deli. So you can see here, NT means not tested. The little dash means that it was tested, but it was negative. And anything with a color in it means it was listeria. And if two colors match, it means it's the same type of listeria. So for whole genome sequencing, uh, we can get really good at figuring out if two listeria are the same. 
So for this particular deli, when we went in April, we only found two positives, but they were both the same type of listeria. So one was in a floor wall junction uh, below a three basin sink, and another was in the cold room on the wall. So sampling was done again in May, and you can see again, we have uh, the same site positive with the same listeria. So it looks like either listeria is able to survive there over time and avoid cleaning and sanitation, uh, or uh, it's reintroduced to that site. We also have for the first time uh, a floor adjacent to the drain. In June, we have a couple of more that turn up positive, a cartwheel and a trash can. In July, you can see that, uh, first of all, more testing was done, and it looks like this uh, particular type of listeria is, is all over the place. But for the first time, we also see a different type of listeria in a different color. August, you can see we have two uh, listeria that we haven't seen before, this pink and this sort of uh, tan. In September, they got lucky. They, we tested every site and we didn't find this blue listeria, but we did find this green one. So some people might stop testing at this point because it looks like they solved their problem. But when we go back in October, you can see that the blue listeria has returned. Same in November and December. So you can see that um, these sort of random colors, these, that greens and pinks and tans, those are not the listeria that we worry about. Uh, they are a problem and we do want to get rid of them, but you can see cleaning and sanitation does seem to address those particular listeria. So what we're really concerned about in this deli is this blue listeria, because this pattern is being found every single month except for December, or except for September, excuse me. Uh, and, it's, and it seems to be uh, all over the place. So this is definitely an issue in this facility. So when I'm talking about a persistent strain, you could see in this last example that this listeria was surviving over several months. And I wanted to remind you that it can survive over several years. So we had a Delhi turkey meat outbreak uh, in 2000 where there were 29 cases. And with whole genome sequencing, they realized that there was actually an additional case in 1988 uh, that was tied to the same food facility. So you can see over, over time, uh, this listeria was able to survive and actually cause essentially two different outbreaks. Uh, another example, so this was in the U.S., the soft cheese, this was in Switzerland, uh, and it was actually a seasonal cheese, and there were actually 122 cases between 1983 and 1987. So surviving over time, despite being a seasonal food and, and um, despite having, having the summers to um, shut down production and dry out a facility, it was still a problem over time. So where does listeria hide then? If it's able to survive over time, how does it do that despite cleaning and sanitation? So I'm gonna be talking about growth niches uh, later in this presentation, but I just sort of wanted to give you an idea of an example. So here's a, a roller on a conveyor belt. And what happens is, is this conveyor belt gets clean during cleaning and sanitation, but this, con this uh, roller does not, and it's actually hollow inside. And so when you take these apart and actually look inside, you can see that they're not actually getting clean. So a big part of cleaning and sanitation should be disassembly of uncleanable equipment so that you can get inside and get the listeria out and kill it uh, and, and prevent listeria from surviving over time. In order to test for those, you need to do sampling. And so we recommend a couple of different sampling devices, either a lot of uh, health departments use sponge sticks. We tend to recommend uh, sponges with gloves. Uh, these are a little bit trickier to use because you have to use new gloves every single time, whereas a sponge stick, uh, you don't need to, to wear gloves, you just need clean hands. Um, and But we recommend if you use either of these that you get the kind with the neutralizing uh, broth so that it can neutralize any sanitizer that you might pick up with your sample. So the reason why we recommend sponges over sticks is because when you get these smaller uh, um, areas, a sponge stick can't really get inside of these smaller areas, whereas a, a regular sponge, you can actually fold it up a little bit and get it into uh, the the smaller areas, and it has a larger surface area. Another thing to be aware of before you go out sampling is to communicate with the lab. So you need to know their capacity, how many samples they can handle. You can't just go out and take 100 samples and hope that they can process all of those. 
Uh, you need to know what types of samples they can handle. Uh, a lot of uh, agencies are getting their labs to switch over to be able to handle sponges just because they're so much better at detecting listeria and picking it up. You need to communicate the importance of using sponges. So if your lab tells you, no, absolutely not, we cannot use sponges, um, it's really important to communicate to them how vital they are just because they're much more likely to, uh, and sponge sticks too, they're much more likely to pick up listeria than say Q-tip uh, swabs, for example. And you need to communicate with the lab that the lab can uh, have the right media on hand. So you can't just dump 100 samples on them uh, on a Friday and hope that they have the materials they need to process them. And so this will really increase turnaround times. So basics of swabbing. You want to find places where pathogens are likely to persist. Uh, you don't want to swab flat surfaces. You want to swab three to four hours into production if possible after the equipment has been running and shaking and things like that. Use pressure and squeeze the sponges into the right places. Uh, make sure you look underneath things and turn things over. It's amazing how often I'll walk into a facility and there will be a table that looks shiny and clean and then you look underneath and it's just disgusting as if it's never been cleaned before. Uh, you want to go until you get stopped. So if you can go underneath and behind equipment, uh, just remember if it's difficult to get to, it's difficult to clean. And don't be afraid to get dirty. Uh, um, I think I've got a picture here. So your knees should definitely look like you've been on the ground collecting samples after you've, uh, after you've done that. And remember to dress warmly. A lot of facilities that have listeria issues are actually refrigerated. And because of that, you wanna be able to really spend time to uh, uh, get the swabs done and do them well. And you're not gonna do that if you're really, really cold and you wanna get, get out of there as soon as possible, especially when you go into coolers and freezers and things like that. And just a reminder, uh, a lot of the topics I'm covering today really could be their own webinars. So if uh, you want to learn more about this, uh, either check our website or let me know. Um, and this is recorded again if you want to go back to some of these lists. So when you're thinking about swabbing, there's really three approaches. So for food facilities, they're really going to have more of a routine environmental monitoring program. So they're really going to test all over. They're looking for listeria because they want to actually get rid of it but they're really also going to be making sure that they're getting a lot of samples over in the finished product and some of the drier areas of the facility just to make sure that their control programs are working and their traffic patterns are working. For public health agencies, their approaches might be closer to an inspection and investigation. And so their uh, sponges are really going to be focused in the areas that are either high, uh, have the highest likelihood of being contaminated uh, and the areas that are at the highest risk of contaminating product. So when you're thinking about a surface like this, uh, it's, it's easy to think about uh, swabbing like a one inch, uh, one foot by one foot area, uh, but we really discourage that because when you're, you're told to do one foot by one foot, you sort of pick a side here, you know, uh, and get your one foot by one foot, but we really want is you want the place that's most likely to be contaminated and most likely to survive cleaning and sanitation. And so in this picture on the right, uh, that, that area is really the, the crack in between these two surfaces. Um, so we really discourage sort of the training that tells people to do one foot by one foot, because even in this picture in the bottom right, you can see that they're getting this smooth, uh, flat surface that's very easy to clean when they really should be swabbing uh, in, the, in the corners here, in this crack. Uh, and they actually should also be using a sponge and not a, and not a Q-tip. So when you're selecting sampling sites, it's helpful to know the pathogens. So for example, we're talking about listeria. So listeria really likes cold and wet environments. Uh, whereas if you were swabbing for salmonella, they, they really like the, the drier environments. Um, although they can, you know, listeria can survive in drier environments and salmonella can survive in wet environments. So that's not a hard and fast rule. Uh, you want to identify potential niches and remember to keep your eyes open and look everywhere, including up. So look to see the ceiling, for example, is there condensation? Uh, go inside of freezers, cold rooms, and remember that dirty is not always better. Sometimes you'll see something really muddy and you want to sample that, but oftentimes there's other organisms that are going to outcompete listeria. So uh, 
things that don't look that dirty but are still sort of a crack or a crevice might be your best bet. So where to sample? Uh, things like drains, floors, fatigue mats, drip pans. Uh, again, we're recording this, so if you want to come back to these sort of examples, um, you definitely can. So I'll take you through a few pictures. So this is an, an example of a fatigue mat. Uh, for OSHA purposes, it's often nice to have um, these thick rubber mats because then your, your uh, employees can stand on these and then uh, it's going to reduce the pressure on their body. Uh, for standing for long periods of time. But from a listeria perspective, these are actually a huge issue because listeria actually goes and lives in the middle of these mats and cleaning and sanitizers can't get to them. Uh, so what happens is, is even though you soak this whole thing in, in sanitizer, for example, as soon as you put it back out on the floor and you have a 185 pound person step onto it, all of the listeria uh, squeezes out. So we actually had a food facility where they had these mats and they were constantly coming up positive and no matter what they tried, they, they couldn't seem to get them clean. So they ended up tossing out all of these mats and buying uh, orthopedic shoes for all of their employees. And what happened was, is they never actually found uh, the, they, their, they stopped their listeria, persistent listeria problem by throwing out these mats. Here's an example of a floor wall juncture. You can see that this one isn't really flush with the floor and there's actually water getting underneath here. So this is a great place for listeria to hang out and a really tough place for cleaning and sanitation to be effective. So this is another good place to sample. Here's an example of a squeegee. Uh, foam squeegees, uh, sometimes facilities like them because they're cheaper and they sometimes work a little bit better, but as a result, they're a great place for listeria to live. So we really recommend rubber squeegees and even those, they can become cracked and damaged and a great place for listeria to live. Here's an example of a food facility where they had caulking along the wall and it wasn't done very well. So if you zoom in, you can see it's sort of rough along the edges and another great place for listeria to hang out. Brushes are another good example. Uh, these are actually hollow inside and then you've got the, the brush bristles going inside and it's almost impossible to effectively clean these. So these are another good example. Here's another example of brushes. This one actually has something literally growing out of it. This is a brush that's actually used for uh, the, the wash uh, process for a cheese rind. Uh, these are also, again, very difficult to clean. Uh, I think some facilities either have a replacement policy where they replace them, whether they need to or not, every, every couple of months. Uh, and some other facilities just cook their brushes as a way to kill listeria. Anytime you have sandwich junctures, either with the floor or within equipment, uh, that's another great example of how listeria can get into these niches, but cleaning and sanitizers cannot. Here's a, an example of a drain. Uh, so this, this drain actually came up positive when we went to go and sample it. We actually sampled this uh, pipe as well, and that was also positive. And maybe some of you have already noticed that there's a dead end at the end of this pipe. Uh, and, and dead end pipes and food facilities are really a no-go for several reasons, but basically you've got sitting water in here and who knows what else, and this is gonna be a great place for listeria to hang out. Additionally, you might see that when this drain was built, it looks like they overcut the flooring, and so you've got a nice floor crack here as well where listeria can hang out. So all of these are great sampling sites. A lot of times we get asked, uh, should we even sample drains? And the answer is yes. So drains are an easy way to really capture the whole room because chances are if something's in the room, it's gonna get cut, uh, hit with water and then that's gonna drain, uh, flow into the drain. So that's a great place to start. Um, many facilities have also have practices in place uh, where you can, uh, for example, high pressure hoses and that'll allow bacteria to get from the drains onto the other pieces of equipment. So there's also the possibility that a positive in a drain will actually make it out of the drain. Here's a picture of myself and my colleague. We actually were in a fruit packing house um, and we saw this drain and when we first saw it, it actually looked like it was sealed into the floor. And when we tried to lift it together, we were actually able to lift it off. So this is us uh, taking the cover off 
and this is the inside. And so this is in a food facility and you can see this drain is very deep, uh, pretty old, and it's got that nice pipe sticking out. So we actually were able to take several samples in this drain uh, and it takes an effort. So this is a picture of me actually collecting the sponge. And so when I said earlier that you might have to get dirty in order to collect your sponge samples, I really wasn't kidding, you know. When you're collecting samples, that's not the day to be wearing a, a nice white coat. So I'm going to talk for a second about uh, delis and retail. Here's that map again. Uh, so, so you're again, same, same idea. You're looking for places that are difficult to clean. So for example, deli cases, uh, deli slicers, deli sinks, things like that uh, are all going to be good, good sites to check. Uh, cold storage rooms are another, whether you're in a food facility or you're in a retail environment, cold storage rooms, floors, shelves, and then the seals around the doors are great places to check for listeria and squeegees again. Uh, for retail sites that are not deli, like uh, cheese and produce, so for example on this map there's, there's other sections that you might want to check for listeria. Uh, again, you're looking at sinks, uh, drains, floors, squeegees, the same sort of ideas um, uh, and the same approach. So here's an example uh, from, a, from a paper that came out in 2014 that shows you they, they collected hundreds of sponge samples in delis and so they're number one uh, in terms of prevalence. So they took 119 uh, samples and 41 of them were positive from a cold room drain. So the drain in the cold room was actually uh, had the highest prevalence. And so you can see some other examples here along the way uh, that would be good to check. If you, from a retail establishment, or let's say you go into retail establishments often, I would recommend you check out Haley Oliver uh, from Purdue University. She does a lot of research related to retail, uh, Listeria and retail environments. So I'll take you through a couple of pictures of things to look for in delis. So we already saw this one, deli cases, deli slicers. Um, here are some more from deli cases. And you really want to go down into the coils, into the fans, and really get to the places that aren't getting clean, that aren't uh, really being disassembled appropriately. Here's a few more examples. Remember to go behind the deli counters, uh, underneath uh, tables, underneath sinks, uh, behind shelves. A lot of times when you go into retail environments and restaurants, the equipment in there is actually designed to be moved around, so it's really light. And you can actually pull uh, tables and stoves and things away from the walls. And that's great for sampling, so don't be afraid to move stuff around uh, as long as it's safe. The other thing to keep in mind is that because they're so easily moved, they're actually uh, oftentimes hollow. So think about hollow legs in these environments and Listeria living there and maybe collect some samples there as well. Here's just another example of, of what I'm talking about there. You can see the slicer, uh, the three basin sink, just a lot of different areas where, where Listeria could be hanging out. Here's another example of a sink. So if you want to get a sample here, you're definitely going to have to get onto the floor to actually get a good sample. And again, uh, look at the legs here. Think about, are these hollow legs? Should we collect a sample at one of these legs? Here's a cold room. Cold rooms are another great place uh, to sample, as I mentioned earlier, you know, on the floors, uh, look for condensation, and definitely get the seal around the, the door of these cold rooms and, and the, in the handles too. These aren't getting cleaned. More examples, I think this is a drain on the right and you got a floor wall juncture on the left. Uh, just just another, other great places to sample. Deli slicers, oftentimes these aren't properly disassembled for cleaning. And so as a result, you have a lot of buildup of nasty stuff, including listeria. So uh, deli slicer is actually a great example of uh, disassembly. So when you're doing uh, cleaning and sanitation, you should definitely be disassembling the equipment so that you can properly clean and sanitize. But what this means is that for to do sampling really well, it's actually helpful if you're able to disassemble a little bit. So if you're having trouble finding Listeria in an environment where you think it might be an issue, you might want to uh, take it apart. And so oftentimes the establishment will actually do it for you because they know how to do it. Uh, but sometimes you have to do it on your own. And so you'll have to check with your local de health department or local agency to see if you're even allowed to take equipment apart because some agencies don't allow that. But if you are, 
Uh, and sometimes it's just helpful to know, you know, what's involved with taking something apart. So this is my colleague, Alexa, and she's taking apart this deli slicer. Uh, and you can see that there's a lot of different parts. She needs a couple of tools in order to do this appropriately. Uh, and there's, uh, luckily we, we had pictures, so we knew how to put it back together. So that's also important. You don't want to put it back together incorrectly. You have to be careful too. So this, for example, is the blade of the slicer. So you want to make sure that you're being careful if, if that's involved. Uh, there's actually a special tool for removing this. We didn't have that at the time, so she just had to be careful. Uh, or sometimes you have the um, chainmail gloves that you can use as well. Again, this is just an example of, of disassembly. So even though this is actually a deli slicer that was in fairly good condition, you can see that there's still some buildup going on inside the deli slicer where, where it's just not getting as clean, and that's a great place for listeria. Look underneath equipment too, because you always you sometimes forget uh, what could be going on underneath pieces of equipment. So you can see here, uh, even though it looked like one piece of equipment, it's obviously made up of several pieces. So these are all things that you might want to sample uh, during an outbreak investigation or during routine sampling. So when you're following up with a facility, a lot of times we get asked what to do if they find a listeria in a facility, but it doesn't match the outbreak strain or doesn't match a human case. And so what we tell people is that the facility still needs to deep clean and sanitize and re-swab to confirm that they got rid of it. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to shut down the facility. Because uh, most, especially delis, a lot of delis have listeria, a lot of food facilities have listeria. And what's important is that they, they get rid of the stuff that's surviving over time. So uh, you might be more concerned, for example, if they have a lot of listeria, even if it, none of it matches, or if they have listeria in high risk places, so like food contact surfaces, then you might wanna be uh, a little bit more uh, proactive in your follow-up. But if they have one or two listeria in low risk areas, let's say a drain, and it's not matching the human case, then it's, it's not, you know, let's shut them down until we figure this out. It's, it's not that. So um, 